from magic internet money to it's only used by criminals, Bitcoin sparked a lot of attention and controversy in its only 11 year history. We will cover its technical and economical aspects so that at the end you will be able to have your own opinion on what Bitcoin really is. Let's get back in time in 2008, amid the infamous housing bubble and the financial crisis caused by fractional reserve banking. Along with the stock market crashing, so did the trust in the old financial institutions. This is how this question emerged. Is there a better way to exchange money? A way in which banks are not needed? Are banks really irreplaceable? Later that year, the answer starts to take shape. A person or a group of persons under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto is posting on a cryptography channel the link to a white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Bitcoin is both the name of the protocol, or the code running on the Bitcoin network, and the currency itself. As of February 2020, valued at around 10,000 US dollars. But unlike traditional banking, where transactions are validated by a bank or a central attorney, here it's basically the network reaching a consensus, agreeing or disagreeing whether a transaction is valid or not. This lack of a central point, combined with the Bitcoin code being public, it can be reviewed by anyone, and anyone can contribute to it, and the fact that there is no person, company or government behind Bitcoin, is removing the need to put trust in an entity in order to execute a transaction or to store value on the network. We will further explain how such a setup was achieved, but let that sink in for a second because it is maybe the most important aspect from this video. For the first time in the history of humankind, you can make a transaction without the need to trust anyone. You only need to trust math, more specifically, a particular part of it called cryptography. Let's now have a look at what is needed in order to perform a Bitcoin transaction and how it works. Alice wants to lend 1000 US dollars to Bob. Bob does not have access to a bank account, so she suggests sending him Bitcoin instead, more precisely 0.1 Bitcoin. For Bob to be able to receive this money, he needs a Bitcoin address, similar to the IBA needed for a bank account, and a way to access it like a PIN or password. The difference is that with Bitcoin, Bob can create this address on his own without special permissions from someone else. The first step is to generate a unique sequence of characters called a private key, and based on it, a public key. So, unlike with a bank, Bob chooses the password first and, with the help of cryptography, a unique address is generated from this password. Bob can then share his address with Alice, basically the public key, so that he can receive the money. This can be either done in a text form or as a QR code. Important side note here. The private key is the only way to access the fund stored in a public key. Think of it as a Bitcoin wallet. You should never share it, post it online, or save it as a clear text on your computer. When someone else has access to it, all the funds from that public key are lost. In addition, if the only copy of a private key is destroyed, the corresponding funds are also lost forever. This is how many people were and still are losing their Bitcoin. We will explain in a separate video how to safely store a private key. For now, it's important to keep in mind that there is no Bitcoin support hotline and nobody who can help you retrieve a lost private key. Let's now see what is happening after Alice is sending the 0.1 Bitcoins to Bob's key. In order to understand how the Bitcoin network is working, we will have a look at the technology that completely changed the game on how data is stored on the internet. The blockchain. Blockchain is a public ledger, organized in blocks, which contains records of who owns what at a particular moment in time. But unlike a regular database, it is not stored on a single central server, but duplicated on all the servers in the network. These servers are called nodes. Also, as already mentioned, the name of the person is irrelevant. What is stored is the public key. A transaction means subtracting an amount from a public key and adding it to another one. A transaction is not performed by updating the current block, but by writing it into the next generated block. In the Bitcoin network, the current average generation time of a new block is 10 minutes. This means that the list with who owns what is updated once every 10 minutes. 
The real time balance is in the last block. All the previous ones are acting just as history. The next thing that is happening once a new block is written is that the blockchain is updated in the entire Bitcoin network. This is made possible through the nodes of the network. For the record, the actual size of the blockchain is around 250 gigabytes as of February 2020. Let's now return to Alice, who used her private key to access her funds and to send 0.1 Bitcoin out of them to Bob. The Bitcoin network is informed that she wants to perform a transaction and the nodes check whether she has enough funds to proceed. Her transaction is waiting in a queue to be written in the next block. But since the network is decentralized, which node has the rights to complete the transaction and write it in the new block? Which of the computers in the network is the right one? Well, none of them. The entire network has to reach a consensus in order to generate a new block. While there are many consensus algorithms, which we will cover in a future video, the Bitcoin network is using from the very beginning the proof of work algorithm. Oversimplified, the computers are forced to pay something if they want to gain the right to update. In our scenario, they have to spend energy. A lot. This is the trickiest part in the whole process, but it's where the magic really happens. The process of writing the next block is called mining and it's basically a game of computing power and luck. The miners are given unique IDs called hashes. These hashes identify the previous block and the pending transactions. The computers must then guess a number which, in combination with these hashes, is returning a predefined number of zeros in the resulting hash. Trying to cheat by changing the input data is easy to spot since the hashes will be completely different. This way, the only solution left for the miners is to play fair. The miners are competing against each other in order to find the right solution. Once the solution is found, the miner is allowed to add the newly mined block to the chain and then the rest of the nodes start spreading it into the entire network. But why would miners spend energy to try to mine a new block? Short answer, for a reward. The same as with gold mining, with the difference that here the reward is in Bitcoin. This is how new Bitcoins are introduced to the market. The rewards are cut in half every 210,000 blocks until the last Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140. As of today, around 18.2 million Bitcoins have been mined, out of the total of 21 million ever in existence, which is roughly 87%. We explain how miners and nodes are securing the network. However, like it's always the case with something of value, someone will want to make it his. For a hacker to steal Bitcoins from the network, he has to move them to his own address. Since balances are updated with every new block, he must be able to write a corrupted block to the network. But this means that an invalid solution must be accepted as a valid one, which is only possible if the attacker disposes of 51% of the computing power, otherwise the solution is rejected. This is called the 51% attack. So how secure is the Bitcoin network then? First, we have to understand that there is no such thing as a bulletproof software, hardware or locking system in general. However, Bitcoin is unarguably the most secure network that exists on the internet nowadays. Security is achieved by two key elements. It's decentralized. The information is duplicated everywhere, so there is no single point of attack or failure, and no one knows the majority of the computing power. The computing power of the network itself, measured in hash rate, or how many hashes can be calculated in a second, is huge. As of now, this is 120 million tera hashes per second, or 120 followed by 18 zeros per second. To achieve such a computing power, the Bitcoin network uses in one year more electricity than a country like Belgium, Romania or Switzerland. Spending this amount of energy in order to perform an attack is therefore highly unlikely. Let's return to Alice and Bob. After the block was mined, the transaction is finally recorded on the blockchain. The entire network learned that Bob's public key contains now 0.1 bitcoins more, without knowing who Bob really is. Bob is however the only one who can ever access them. Although using public keys instead of this might look like bitcoin is anonymous, it actually isn't. It's definitely less anonymous than cash. Alice knows who is behind that public key. Although there are ways to achieve anonymity with bitcoin, it's safe to assume that by default it's not anonymous. The key takeaways from this video are Bitcoin offers an alternative to banks as a way to transact without the need to trust anyone. 
the Bitcoin network uses the blockchain technology with the proof-of-work consensus mechanism. The transactions are borderless and censorship resistant. As long as they are valid, they cannot be blocked. No entity, be it a person, company or government, can access the funds stored on blockchain without the private key. The private key should never be shared, stored online or lost. Bitcoin is not anonymous. Thank you for watching. In this video, we cover the technical part behind the Bitcoin network. In our next episode, we will cover the economical model behind it. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell button.